And so he was fearful of what Esau was going to do because when he left, Esau threatened to kill him. And I don't think it was an idle threat. I think Esau was ready to take care of that young brother, that, that one that was getting in my way and stealing from me and, and doing all these things to make my life miserable. And he was getting all the good stuff. So next time I see him, he's a dead man. We are talking about turning points, God's turning points. And we've talked about the fact that, um, I'm going to move ahead a little bit, that the turning point is a point at which some kind of a decisive change takes place. And last week, Nancy was talking about, Nancy Farr, how one turning point she'd experienced was, was when her children left the nest. And I suspect every mother kind of has that feeling when, especially when the last one leaves, that, whoa, the little birds are leaving. We saw some birds today, you know, the sandhill cranes? And they had a little fuzzy one. The little ones have fuzz all over them. Well, there was a little fuzzy with them this morning. Kind of neat to see that. But that was a turning point that she is a, a lady had experienced. Uh, anybody have another turning point today that, that strikes you uh, as something that people experience or something that is a decisive kind of a twist or turn of events? Anybody got one? No. We've talked about a lot of them, but... Anybody ever seen a turning point lit recently? Got one right up here. Job Just a minute. Job decisions. Job decisions. Taking How? one, not taking one, promotion, not promoting, changing, okay. changing location. A promotion, that's typically a good one, right? If, if, there's, if there's a reduction in force, you know what that means? You're fired. It's a nice way of saying it, reduction in force, uh, change of location. I've got this opportunity, it's in Tug Bustle, Tennessee, right up there where Stacy's from. Uh, Ray. Okay, uh, one of the major decisions in my life that changed my life and my children's life is divorce. Divorce, divorce. yes, yes. Most families have experienced a separation, a divorce in the family. Um, and that is a very critical turning point in a lot of ways uh, you know, for a lot of people at, at one time. So yes, uh, I got one on the front row. I, you're getting your exercise today. You could probably play in the final four. We're getting you all shaped up here for this. The birth of a new baby in the family. The birth of a new baby. Uh, when we had our first baby, we didn't know what to do. Oh, we kind of knew what to do theoretically. But there's a big difference between theoretical and concrete. And so all the way home for about 10 miles, we had this moment of realization. He's ours, we gotta keep him. <laughs> we gotta do something when we get home. We had 10 miles to figure it out from the hospital home. And um, I think it probably wasn't enough. We needed about 20 miles to get it all figured out. But, uh, that baby, that does change a lot of things in a lot of ways forever. Uh, forever. Um, okay, let's next week kind of think of some others. I think we've looked at some interesting turning points and uh, uh, I think we just need to kind of think about that because as we're saying, God has turning points and that's what we're all trying to look at is the turning points. Um, Let's move ahead here. Let's move back. I've got the power. Uh, today we're going to talk about Jacob the deceiver. And um, you all have heard of Jacob, right? And it's an interesting moniker. When we start out, he's the deceiver. And what does the deceiver do? He misleads others, right? Uh, I've known some people that misled people because they didn't tell the whole truth. They told their truth, and I don't feel like I'm on. Maybe I fell off here. Um, but it was just enough truth to mislead somebody. And uh, I think Jacob kind of falls in that category. Uh, we're going to be in Genesis 25, 26, 27. So open your Bibles to that part of, of Genesis. 
but he was misleading others. Um, if you are a father-in-law, or if you have a father-in-law, think about him misleading his father-in-law. However, he would say in his defense, he misled me first. I'm just trying to get even with him. So it really wasn't my fault. He did it first, and I'm just getting back at him. Um, a deceiver has a false appearance or a false statement, lies. Uh, a deceiver typically does it habitually. I knew a fellow once that was a habitual liar, and he would tell lies even when the truth was better. And um, you just didn't know what to believe. If, if he said something, you were kind of suspect of what he said, so you were thinking in other directions. But Jacob, as we see him grow into manhood from a young fellow, we see him lying to people, deceiving people, uh, weaseling around. So he's not the kind of character early on that uh, we aspire to be like, is what I'm saying. But it's amazing what God can do with weak people. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands today, but God can take people who don't have a lot going and do something with them. I'll raise my hand on that. Uh, and aren't we glad that God is able to take less than perfect and use it effectively? And we'll see that today as we get this. Uh, there's that old phrase my mother used to t say to me, and you probably heard it too, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Now that's an old wives' tale, but you stop and think about it. You start weaving these untruths, and all of a sudden you're, you're kind of forgetting now, what did I say over there? I mean, <laughs> I, I gotta keep this thing going, and so I've really gotta work harder at remembering all the deceptions so I can keep it straight, where if you, uh, are trying to tell the truth, you kind of don't have to worry so much about getting all the details just right. And uh, as we think about Jacob being a deceiver, uh, he was weaving a web of deception. And um, so maybe there's a lesson there for us. Let's move ahead here. Well, maybe we're gonna move ahead here. I got the right, oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, as we look at that family of Isaac and Rebecca and the two boys, we will see that sibling rivalry was a part of it. You had Esau and you had Jacob. And that sibling rivalry seemed to start early, didn't it? Remember when uh, in the birthing process, and they were twins, they were not identical as far as I can tell from the scripture, they were fraternal. but. Jacob grabbed the heel of Esau as the birthing process was taking place. Yes, sir. They didn't start even earlier than that, though, because they got the word from God that the younger brother was going to, or the older brother was going to serve the younger brother. So, I mean, that sibling rivalry right there started from God's word. Yep. And what the mother and the father heard. God was trying to explain this thing. Now, Let's get this straight. That younger one, he's going to be the one I'm going to utilize. He's going to be the one that's going to provide the leadership and, and it's going to fulfill, at least in his time frame, what I want to have done. And so that was going against what man typically thinks. And, and in that day, if you were the older one, you got the birthright, which meant you got a lot of stuff and property and, and status and so forth. And uh, God said, no, that's not the way we're going to do it. And Jacob grabs a hold of the heel. We didn't have twins. We had uh, children pretty close together. Um, but uh, those who have had twins, uh, I think there's a lot of work there. I know there was when there was an 18-month gap there. So uh, I got to say that uh, these parents, all of a sudden, they didn't have any children. And all of a sudden, be careful what you pray for. Because <laughs> we'll give you a double. But you're right. It was part of God's plan. And that sibling rivalry continued even into adulthood. And you remember when um, Jacob brought his family back to his home place, to his home country. And he didn't know what Esau was thinking because they hadn't seen each other in 20, 20 some years. And so he was fearful of what Esau was going to do because when he left, Esau threatened to kill him. 
And I don't think it was an idle threat. I think Esau was ready to take care of that young brother, that, that one that was getting in my way and stealing from me and, and doing all these things to make my life miserable. And he was getting all the good stuff. So next time I see him, he's a dead man. And one thing about Jacob, I think he did have a good memory. And so you remember how he came back and divided up his family and so forth. The other thing about this is the parental favoritism. And I suspect you, when you were children, you never noticed parental favoritism, uh, perceived or otherwise. And we had two boys, and I think that would flare up. Oh, you like him better than you, you do me. Or you let him do this and you didn't let me do that. You, have you heard those kind of things? Uh, or did you say some of those things? Uh, so there's that feeling that maybe you're favoring the one over the other. But in this case, there was favoritism, wasn't there? How did that break out? Who, who favored one over the other? Up, up. Just a minute, we want to get that on, on, on the air, on the R. Okay, try it again. Isaac favored Esau, Rebecca favored Jacob. Yes. Uh, Dad seemed to like Esau and have a lot of confidence. Mom liked the other one, Jacob. And it's interesting as parents, if we do that, <laughs> that is really sowing some discord right there. Um, and there were certain days where I liked one over the other because the one was being good and the other one wasn't, but it wasn't a permanent thing. Uh, I, I punished them the same. Uh, they didn't get any preferential treatment there. But there's that concept. But in this case, I think the scripture is really clear that, that you had favoritism going on. And, and that's not a good thing in a lot of ways, although it was God's plan that the young one was going to be the, the one. And so in a sense, God was showing favoritism in, in that sense. But you and I aren't God when we have children. Um, and so we, we need to be careful of that. And uh, that, that favoritism really promoted the rivalry, didn't it? Because I can outdo you and so forth. Um, and the deception there. Uh, when things really got hot, um, the mother said, Let's deceive dad. Remember that part of the story? Uh, and, and what was the deception, basically? It, it was securing that birthright with food, essentially. I mean, Esau already, turned, Esau already turned over his birthright, but they were actually securing the full deception, getting it from uh, um, Isaac. Right. Right. It was one thing for him to be tricked by his brother into giving up his birthright. But to make it official, the father had to go through this ceremony of laying on of hands and, and bestowing that officially. And so uh, even though Esau had given it up, it wasn't official until the dad made it official. And here's mom saying, I have a plan. I have a plan. We're going to put some goat hair on you. You're going to, to fix the favorite meal that Esau usually fixes for dad. You're going to go in, and, and by that time, uh, Isaac's vision was not what it ought to be, and he was nearly blind. And so goes through the, the ruse. Arms are hairy. You smell like Esau. You've got my favorite meal. I mean, it was a complete uh, charade, or as some people say, charade. Um, and here's the mom promoting it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, from your perspective, what about that? From my perspective, uh, and a lot of the readings that I've read on this topic, because a lot of parenting books actually cover this biblically, she was trying to promote God's plan through deception. And, and I, I don't know, I don't agree with that, but I think it's really unusual that she did choose to try to follow God by using deception and how ironic that is. Mm -hmm. Which is an interesting thought. I'm just doing God's work because God selected this person. I'm just trying to help God out. And uh, do we need to help God out by being deceivers? 
We got another opinion. There. I was going to say right before, right before the whole deception came about too, though, it does mention that Esau took a wife who was a Hittite woman and gave the parents grief. So that right there kind of, you know, hey, I got good reason to deceive because this is not God's plan. God doesn't mm -hmm. want us marrying Canaanite people, Hittite people, you know, all these not part of God's nation type people. Yeah, uh, we can find reasons to do certain things. And that's a good reason. Uh, God said not to mix these people. This son of mine went out there on purpose and, and, and got some heathen wives and, and went against God. So uh, that's not what God wants. So I'm going to invest in the other one, the other boy here, who hasn't gone out and, and done things. And so that must be the right one. Sometimes we get in trouble because we think the right one's the right one, but it could be the wrong one. Um, I really hope that as we make decisions and, and look at situations, that we can truly say in our mind, I want to do what God's will is, and I'm going to do my best to try to sort that out, and I'm going to try to do my best to be in line with God's will, and I'm going to pray about it. And, and we don't know, uh, you know, give her the benefit of the doubt. She was trying to raise her boys. She was trying to do God's will. Uh, and sometimes it gets a little messy. And I think this is an example of how messy things can get. And I think it gets messy when um, we think we're doing God's will and it really isn't. And God has to bring us back to his point of view so that uh, things are going to be right. And it amazes me, and maybe I shouldn't be amazed, but I'm just a guy, how God can take some things that aren't so good, and yet his, his will shall be done. And that's the essence of what we're trying to do here, the turning points that God has used. And I wonder if all of his people, after Adam and Eve, if all of his people had been perfect, just think, there wouldn't be any turning points because it'd be a straight line. It'd be a linear thing. It'd be a vector. But it wasn't a vector. There was these twists and turns, and God had to come back and say, uh, here's what we're going to have to do to fix this thing, to make it work, because I have a plan. And that plan goes from here to here to here, and it's not going to go like this, although it is, and then I'm going to repair it and fix it and we're going to stay on path for what I need to have done for you man and woman uh, hence the turning points that we have to have anything else about this idea of the rivalry the favoritism the deception that strikes you today uh, as we look at kind of the setup of this situation any other thoughts or questions we have plenty of intelligence here we can get the answers but other yes sir Wait a minute, let my man get to you there. You're going to have to step it up a little there, Stacy. Well, it, it reminds me of working on a, on a job. Somebody's in charge. Yes. And he lays out the work and how it's to be done. And when you come upon what you perceive as a problem, you can solve it your own way, but that might not please the boss. So in, a lot of times you have to go to the boss to find out mm -hmm. a solution to the problem. And they didn't. They took it upon themselves to, uh, well, the wife did, took it upon herself to solve a problem, and it wasn't the correct way. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see her saying, you know, God, things aren't going quite like we thought they were, but I can fix it. I, I have a plan. I can, can work this out, and, and I'm going to send the younger one up there and, and be with family, and we'll get him all straightened out, and he can kind of get his feet under him, and find a good wife, and uh, his uncle will help him out. And, uh, of course, that's a whole other deception, isn't it? When you, We're not going to go there today, but the deceiver got deceived. So it became a question, who can out-deceive whom? I think that's the correct uh, wording on that. And I think Jacob actually came out ahead of that game of deception because by the time he started heading back home, he had amassed a lot of wealth based on just the number of animals, uh, the number of boys he had. Think about that 20-year period. There was a lot going on there. And 
a study of that would be interesting, but we haven't got time for that today. But uh, God is going to have to make it right even when we try to fix it and it's not quite right. And he does. And I think we ought to take a lot of, of uh, encouragement that he's doing that. Uh, so we look at him, God saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work through this. And why would he do that? Well, let me go to the next slide. If I can get that one to go. Come on here. There we go. God had a purpose, and he had promised Abraham that I'm going to take you and your offspring, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. That was one of the promises. And if you and I were looking at it, we'd say, the raw materials here don't look so good to make a great nation. Because it seems like every time that they turn around they're doing something that's not quite what I'm looking for here but he promised that uh, there's going to be a great nation Abraham left home and that was part of God's plan he said Abraham I want you to pack up your stuff and leave and of course you've heard the thing about uh, Sarah saying okay but uh, have you googled it do we know exactly the route we're going uh, do we know how long it's going to take to get there so that we can be prepared and, and so forth and so on? And of course, Abraham, I imagine, said, I got a cover between God and me. We'll handle that. And so Sarah said, OK, but make sure you don't mess up. <laughs> I got to get my stuff together here. But Abraham left home to a place he didn't know he was going by faith. And God had planned that. Uh, the promise to, to, to Isaac there in 26, again, reinforcing the idea that uh, I'm going to use you to fulfill what I need to have done. And uh, then, of course, Jacob, uh, when he became Israel, after he'd wrestled with the angel, God, and kind of came to his senses, name changed from Jacob to Israel, and one of the things that I find interesting is, as we see God's plan truly unfolding, uh, we get down to the point where Jacob has been, or I mean, Joseph has been sold into slavery. Talk about sibling rivalry. Uh, that takes it to a whole nother level. At least they didn't kill him. But they probably would if it hadn't been for Reuben saying, look, boys, we can't do this. But we can deceive our father who is known to be a deceiver. Does deception breed deception? Um, I'll let you figure that out. But uh, anyway, Jacob is sold into slavery. He's sent down to Egypt, a foreign country. Uh, no hope. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, that's part of God's turning point. To say, I'm going to keep my promise. You know, it's interesting. God makes many promises to us. You and, you and me, we have promises that God has given us. And he will keep them. There's no question about that. He's going to keep his promises to us. The challenge is, can we do what we need to do to be pleasing to God? And that's an everyday challenge, I'm sure, for, for everybody in here. But um, as it says there, if we had time to look at it, we have... Um, 70 souls if you look in genesis 46 it says when jacob and his family moved to egypt at the request of joseph 70 souls went down into egypt and that's the beginning of a great nation well it's the beginning and it's one that uh god planned Let's look at some of God's purposes and outcomes as we think about how God makes things happen. Uh, one of the things here is Joseph went from a slave to a ruler. Now that's an amazing story right there. Does that usually happen? Not usually. Uh, did Joseph know that was going to happen when he got down there and was Potiphar's slave? And then uh, I think it was mentioned uh, in the sermon uh, or in, in class recently where 
Joseph was finally kind of getting settled in as a servant, and then it went from bad to worse. Falsely accused, sent to jail, from one level of jail down to the next level of jail, people forgetting him, people not keeping their word, and there he is sitting there in, in the middle of nowhere in jail with no hope and no people to, he didn't have a public defender uh, back then. And so, yet, how is this working that Joseph becomes second in the kingdom? Well, we know the, the story, the uh, interpretation of dreams, Pharaoh saying, this guy's on the ball. I need a guy like this. And so places him in that position second in the kingdom. Uh, the fact that God chose to protect Jacob and the family in Egypt. They weren't thinking of going to Egypt, I, I feel certain. And yet God says to Joseph, come on down, we'll take care of you. This is a safe place. This is a place where you're going to have what you need. And I'm, I'm important here. I can see that it's going to happen. And uh, they gave them a special place in the land of Goshen. There was a township up where I grew up, Goshen Township. Don't know why they named it that, but that, I lived ne very near Goshen. Uh, and uh, then we know the next thing, the twists and turns. They're doing really well. They got a man in the, in the kingdom that's controlling everything. And then it says, another Pharaoh grew up that did not fill in the blank. Did not know God, did not know Joseph. A new regime. And all of a sudden, these, these guests were turned into slaves. From being a guest and having all that you need to becoming a slave. And, and we don't have time to look at all that, but the slavery got more oppressive, didn't it? As they were told to, to build for the Pharaoh, they had to get the stuff they needed. And they didn't go to uh, Lowe's to get it, but they had to, to work harder and harder and harder. And some would probably say, how is this going to create a great nation? God, you promised to make a great nation out of you. Is this your idea of a great nation? We're slaves. Matter of fact, it's getting worse instead of better. And so we, we see that. Uh, we talked early on about an oxymoron. And I think them becoming slaves when he had promised to make a great nation, that's pretty much an oxymoron in my mind about what, what's happening here, God. It, this isn't turning out quite like we thought. Uh, and so we, we see God's purposes, outcomes uh, in, in various ways. Uh, let's talk about any thoughts about how this thing unfolded in a very, what we would say, uh, unusual way. Uh, we've got Richard over here. He's got a thought. Well, I was kind of giving some thought to the, the, the title of the lesson, God's Turning Points. And you, you touched on the fact that God had a plan from the beginning. If you really think about it, a turning point is an event that causes a change of direction in our life. And God didn't really have a lot of turning points, but God has milestones in his plan. He has things that he had put in place and those never changed. And he reached those milestones, but those milestones create, God may, be, may not have turning points, but he creates turning points for his people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of what this is. Uh, the, the, the fact of God's people becoming a slave, if you look at the a, 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 fam, a nation of slaves, if you look at the big picture, this was just all part of his plan and creates a, a type or an antitype for God's people in the New Testament. So it's all just part of, just part of God's plan. You raise a good point. He can take humble people like you and me if we'll keep trying to do what he wants us to do, he can, uh, what's that old phrase about the, uh, taking uh, success out of the jaws of defeat. Although with some of the, the basketball teams, it was taking a, 
the, the, the jaws of victory and leading it to defeat if you've been watching any of the basketball games. But uh, God has promised, and he promised Abraham, he promised Isaac, Jacob, he's promised us as a part of his latest covenant that he's going to take care of us, he's going to lead us. Uh, if we'll follow him, he will bless us immensely. Um, and that, you can take that to the bank, as they used to say. God's promised that. Uh, he's promised to forgive us. He's promised to restore us. Uh, he's promised to help us move from where we shouldn't be to where he needs us to be. Uh, and it's interconnected. One of the good things about a church, and I, I uh, uh, know uh, of a family that went to another church recently. Uh, they were invited and they went. And the fellowship didn't seem to be the same as what I experience here. Uh, and by that I mean, if I've got a problem, or if there's something not right, I feel I've got people can help me. And then just the old elders. I mean, there's other people that if I need some help, I feel I could call you up. I could let you know I, I need some help here because I'm in over my head. And I think you could help me. And, and if you could help me, I think you'd say, I'll be right over. Or come over and we'll work on this or whatever. There's that built-in help. And that's what God intended here. And um, he's going to protect us. He's going to use one another. The idea of Joseph, who would have thought he was going to protect his family at the state he was in? But God had a plan, and God's going to make that plan work in spite of you and me's mistakes. We can make a lot of mistakes, but God's plan will continue on. And he has limited himself, in one sense, to use us. When you stop and think about that, God has some faith in us. We have faith in God. But if he's saying, I'm going to limit myself in a sense to using weak little humans who can make all these mistakes and, and who are selfish and you know, fill in the blanks, but I am going to use them to see that my will's done and it's going to be a blessing to mankind. That is really an interesting way of looking at it, but I sense that's kind of what he, he has said to us. He's going to love us. He's going to lead us. He's going to bring champions to help us. The whole book of Judges is about champions, is it not? Problems multiplied, and a judge would come up and would save the day. Didn't ride in on a white horse. We talked about Gideon, and certainly he didn't ride in on a white horse. He was hiding uh, at the time that God said, You're my man. I've got a job for you to make sure my will goes forward. And so uh, it's, it's interesting how God chooses to use and, and so forth. Let's move on here and look at how does this apply to us today? We're kind of getting there already. Um, because it does relate to us today, even though this took place so long ago. But God's plan will prevail. We've already kind of uh, discussed that. Uh, if that is true, that God's plan will prevail, what does that say to you as, as a Christian? What does that mean to you? Wait a minute. I'm just going to say it gives us comfort in knowing that God, God has... You know, like our children's song, he's got the whole world in his hand. That's a good song. We probably need to sing that or at least hum it to ourselves every now and then, like every day, uh, to put the power where it is. Um, God's plan will prevail. Uh, another thought over here with Ray. Well, the ultimate plan is that we as his children will be with him for eternity. That promise of eternity for his faithful children um, is interesting. And, and if you were not here Wednesday night, you didn't hear um, Santa help us understand what goes on after you die. And um, so 
whatever is right after we die, wherever we temporarily go, or uh, there's some theories on that, and I'm not saying your theory is, is wrong or right, but, but about, you know, Gehenna, and, and, and is there a waiting place? Uh, I laugh about Florida. I've heard people say, well, this is the train station where all these old people are waiting to go to heaven. And I've kind of gotten to the point where I feel like I'm sitting in that train station, and uh, I hope that the board is right. And this, one, this train's coming and it's going to heaven. I'm, I'm hoping I'm in the right place for that. But, um, yeah, the, the promise that we can have as God's people, that no matter what may happen here, uh, Jesus talked about it, didn't he? Uh, don't worry, because in my Father's house are many mansions is the, the phraseology I remember in that passage. And uh, they're waiting for you. And uh, for my faithful people, it's already there. It's already prepared. And, and you don't have to worry about it. You may have to worry about stuff here, but I've got you covered. It's going to happen. Um, what else about God's plan prevailing or any, any thoughts on that? Don't everybody speak at once. Okay, we got another one in the back. You know, we like to think things are easy and, you know, God will just make everything happen for us. Um, you know, there's terms today like helicopter mom and lawnmower mom where, you know, they hover over and come down and protect the child from something or they get in front of them and mow down all the obstacles for them. We'd like to think that God is a helicopter God or a lawnmower God, and he's going to make everything in our path clear as long as we do what he wants us to do. But unfortunately, if you look at the Bible and you look at, at the history of the famous people in the Bible, you know, it's exactly the opposite. You know, he gives us free will. He gives the devil the opportunity to whisper in our ear and send us a strong delusion if, if we're not following after him. Um, you know, ultimately, God's plan will prevail. Usually, when we see bad things happen, and we, in the in the Bible, we get to see the results of that, and it turns out for good. So, so God's ultimate plan. Even Job went through horrible things and ended up better off than he was when it started. But any time along the way, everybody would have said, "How can God let this happen?" Even Job said that. You know, that's a normal thing for most people that are struggling with their Christianity. Is how does God let bad things happen to good people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's not helicopter guy. <laughs> he, yeah. You know, he's, he's there to rely on through the tough times. He's there to challenge, you know, to allow us to be challenged to what we say about him. We actually, that's the way we are going to live. And we're going to live not about ourselves, but we're going to live about uh, uh, others and about him. And, and God's plan will prevail one way or the other. But in, along the way, it's not going to be all roses and uh, prosperity. Uh, some of us may have noticed that already, uh, Chris. Uh, I think it's an interesting relationship that we have with God. Uh, God's will shall be done. There's no question. That, that's definitely going to happen. But God chose to give his creatures, that would be you and me, free will. We get to make choices. We get to make good choices and we get to make bad choices, and he's there to help us if we are willing to ask for his help and sincerely seek his way. But this free will versus God's will, that, that's the thing that, that really creates a lot of interesting situations. Richard, another thought. The other thing we have to keep in mind is the phrase, God's plans, not our plan. Mm -hmm. And in today's lesson, we saw the example of how they felt like they needed to help God with his plan a little bit. Uh, but God made it clear, no, it's my plan. And the best example of that, of course, is Abraham and Sarah when the child of promise was not coming along. And they decided, well, we better help God out a little bit and, and uh, you know, bring a child through Sarah's handmaid. And God said very emphatically, this is not the child of promise you're going to have a son and of course he, he fulfilled his promise a, a great example to me of the of, on the positive side of that is Joshua where regardless of the circumstances he said I'm going to do God's will early in his life when 
everyone else said, no, we can't go into the land of promise because of all of these giants that are in the land. Joshua and Caleb, of course, said, of course we can because God is on our side. And then he stood as the leader of the people at the end of his life and said, I don't care who you choose to serve my house and I will be serving God. Yes, very strong, faithful example for us. And we can mess up God's initial plan, but God's will shall be done. And if we can realize that and continue to seek his will, he will make it happen. And it's not always a straight line. Uh, and many characters, David messed up a number of times and he was God's chosen king. And uh, a lot of lessons there. Uh, let's look at another thought here. God can change, can turn negative into positive. And we've kind of alluded to that already, that we can mess it up, but God's will shall be done. And he will work it through. Uh, and he may have to raise up another person to do it, but he can turn the negative to positive, even back to the Garden of Eden. That was a pretty negative situation but it was turned into positive because his will shall be done and it will prevail. Another thought here, uh, Jesus said that we are to deny ourselves and let God work in us in Matthew 16. Uh, he said, deny yourself, take up your cross, whatever that may mean to you on a given day. It could be a burden, it could be a challenge, it could be something that's in the way of you walking in God's way. But if you will every day deny yourself, take up your cross uh, and follow him, uh, it's going to be all right. It may not be exactly as you thought or planned or hoped, but it's going to be all right because God's going to take care of that. Um, I had a person say, if you do that, you're being God-led and not self-led. If you take up your cross daily and follow, you're being God-led and not self-led. Comment in the back. You're painting, you're painting Esau as a bad, 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 bad guy. But you're going down in Genesis chapter 33, verses 1, one through 4. I'll, I'll just read 4. Okay. But Esau ran to meet him, ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the woman and children and said, who are those with you? He, he repented of his, he repented of his revenge against Jacob, Esau did. So Esau is not as bad as what people have a tendency to, to do. How many times have we said and done things that is contrary to what we know to be, to be what God wants us to do? I'm glad you brought that up, and I'd read that when I was preparing this lesson, that Jacob was very fearful that Esau was going to continue to be vengeful, have a grudge, and he was, knew he was powerful enough he could literally destroy the family and destroy him. And he took precautions, but when he got there, it was a totally different thing. Brother to brother, hugging, weeping, accepting one another, and being a part of God's plan. I think that was part of God's plan, that he would welcome him back. And again, God can take a vengeful situation and turn it around so that his will is going to be done. Because what would have happened if uh, Esau had killed Joseph and all his family? Well, we know there could be another turning point, but it wouldn't be a good one. We're out of time. Thank you for your, your time today, your thoughts.